Okay, I think it's time to get started. My clock says 3.30, so it must be 3.30. I'm Mike Clossy, Director of Forestry with the Oregon Forest Resources Institute and also an affiliate faculty member of the College of Forestry. And on behalf of the College of Forestry, Oregon Forest Resources Institute, and the Starker family, I'd like to welcome you to our fourth lecture in the 2011 Starker Lecture Series. The Starker Lecture Series was begun 27 years ago. This is the 27th year of the series. It was begun at the College of Forestry, um, funded by the Starker family to honor um, TJ and Bruce Starker, the founders of Starker Forest, and uh, carried on now by uh, Bond and Bart Starker, their grandson and son, and generations after them. So it's been an important thing for the College of Forestry to host this lecture, and we're really glad to do this series. This year's series, um, the theme is Oregon's Place in World Forests and Forestry, and we took this theme from, this is the United Nations Year of Forests. So 2011, all over the world, we're doing special things to honor forests. So we structured the Starker Lecture this year along the lines of world forestry. So our first lecture, and this year we have a whole lot more sponsors than our normal three, including the World Forestry Center. That's one of the reasons we're here today. But our first lecture was given by Gary Hartshorn, the uh, director of the World Forestry Center, and uh, that was on uh, tropical forests of the world. We had a lecture by Paul Owen of Vanport um, International on the global forest trade and Oregon's role in that. We had a lecture just one week ago today by Ed Pepke of the United Nations FAO talking about world trade and forestry and the report on the world forest. Today's lecture is on global urban forestry and Oregon and the globe and forests and people. And uh, Melanie Kirk from Texas A&M is our speaker. We have one more lecture, which is on May 3rd, featuring um, Ben Kishore, a professor of forestry from Yale, who is an expert on international forestry. And then we'll conclude with a capstone tour, which is gonna focus on global trade in forests and Oregon's role. And uh, there at the uh, door was a poster, flyer, about this year's series. And uh, I would encourage you to get one. Um, in addition to being the, the year of the forest, the other exciting thing about this year's lecture and today's lecture in particular is it's being held in Portland. It's not being held on campus in Corvallis where traditionally the lectures are held. And that's because the theme is about urban forestries. And if you're gonna talk about urban forestry, you need to talk about it in the herb. So in order to do that, we also widened our net for co-sponsors. So we've got co-sponsors today with uh, the City of Portland, uh, Parks and Recreation, Green Space, and Urban Forestry Division, um, Friends of Trees, Forest Park Conservancy, Oregon Community Trees, um, and Portland State University, including the Hatfield School of Government and the Institute for Sustainable Solutions. And we're real proud to have all of these sponsors. And by them participating, it's broadened our, our audience here. So we're really appreciative of all of you. And the World Forestry Center is also a, a co-sponsor. So that's what we're all about. Before I turn it over to Paul Reese to introduce Melanie, um, I just want to mention a couple things. This lecture is being streamed live on the internet. It's also going to be archived. So if you pick up one of the flyers, it has the web page for you to go get the archive. But the important thing is since it is being streamed, the last 15 or 20 minutes when we have questions and answered, Julie back in the back with the blue and me will have microphones. If you want to ask a question, you need to raise your hand and I'll say it then. But you need to wait for the microphone because we want the folks in Ethiopia to hear your answer and question too, not just the folks in this room. So that's part of the global thing is you got to be patient and have a microphone. So without any further ado, I'll introduce Paul to introduce Melanie. Paul Reese is the urban, forest, urban and Community Forestry Director for the State of Oregon. He's with the Oregon Department of Forestry, 
but also with OSU College of Forestry. So we're really proud to, to have Paul as a partner. And this lecture was his idea. And uh, it's a really good idea. So here's Paul. Thank you, Mike. Well, again, welcome to the World Forestry Center and the Starker Lecture Series. Um, also like to welcome those of you that are watching online, especially my students from uh, Forestry Horticulture 455, Urban Forest Planning Policy and Management. Just occurred to me that this is probably fair game for midterm questions, so I'll probably be sitting in the back writing a few down. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Kirk to you this evening, or this afternoon. Um, I first got to know uh, Melanie about six years ago when she and I both served on a uh, teaching cadre for the Municipal Forestry Institute, which is a week-long leadership institute for urban foresters from municipalities across the U.S., Canada, and I think we've actually had a few from, from abroad as well. Uh, Melanie got her bachelor's and master's degrees from Southern University uh, in her native Louisiana, and uh, she is a uh, avid New Orleans Saints fan, so you might hear a reference to that. And also, um, when I took her out to dinner the other night in Corvallis, we had to go to a sports bar so that she could watch the Texas A&M Aggies women's basketball team win the national championship. So she was pretty excited about that as well. Uh, and I should tell you that one of the reasons she's so excited is that Melanie personally mentors some of the girls that are on that, young ladies that are on that basketball team. So. Uh, Melanie uh, has worked in the uh, city of Dallas as a city arborist, and for the last uh, nine years or so, she's been affiliated with the Texas AgriLife Extension Service, uh, where she currently serves as assistant professor at Texas A&M and as a statewide uh, extension urban forestry specialist. So uh, she has a great deal of experience in urban forestry, a, a great perspective to bring you. N uh, Melanie's also served on the National Urban and Community Forestry Advisory Council that advises the uh, U.S. Secretary of Agriculture. So please help me welcome Dr. Melanie Kirk. The back of the room didn't seem that far at first <laughs> until I tried to get up here in a second. Well, first of all, like, um, my colleague Paul Reese just mentioned, I am definitely um, a graduate of and employed by Texas A&M University and in some of the students who were with me yesterday in Cavallis saw that in celebration of the uh, fighting Texas Aggies lady basketball team winning the 2011 NCAA Women's Championship game the other night, I asked that the people that I speak to in Oregon join me in greetings as if I was still in Texas. So are y'all ready? This is to kind of break the ice and let y'all understand my presentation style, okay? So I'm going to say howdy. Believe it or not, on campus, that's how everybody greets everyone at Texas A&M. And I'm hoping that you guys here in Oregon will come back with the howdy, okay? Yes. All right, we think we can do this? All right, let's try it. Howdy. Howdy. All right. See, I won that bet twice. This is great. I had a friend tell me, you're not going to get people in Oregon to say howdy. That's not going to happen, but I just did. So, needless to say, um, being from Louisiana and Texas, I am a talker. I've already warned the cameramen in the room that I'm also a walker, so it's just really going to be horrible for me up here. I just hope I don't fall off the stage. It's kind of small. But um, what I do want you guys to, un to understand is that my uh, presentation style is more conversational. So we're going to put Julie and, and Mike to work a little bit during my presentation because I feel that if for whatever reason you have a question, um, you can just ask it then. Raise your hand so they bring the mic to you, but instead of waiting to the end, because it may be something that I'm, I may have forgot to mention on that slide, and your question actually would trigger something in my presentation. So if you don't mind, if there is a, um, a question that you might have during my presentation, just raise your hand, a mic will come to you. I'll answer the question now. Understand that if it's something that's coming later, I'll let you know, or we're gonna cover that in a second. But please feel free to ask any question that you want to, all right? With no further ado, I am Dr. Melanie Kirk. I'm the Urban Forestry Specialist and Assistant Press, uh, Professor with Texas AgriLife Extension. I'm actually housed in our district office in Dallas, Texas. It was kind of difficult to do urban forestry in College Station, Texas, so eventually somebody in the system at A&M thought about the fact that it might be 
I guess, smart of us to have an urban forestry in an urban setting. So basically, when I start talking to people about urban forestry, the one thing that they laugh about is that they never really understand the concept of forestry. Many of us who live in urban settings, when we talk about trees in an urban setting, the picture that I'm showing now is what you're accustomed to seeing. And when I talk to most traditional foresters, they really giggle because they're like, you don't even understand what a forest is. And so I like to start all of my presentations off by talking to people about the various different definitions that are out there uh, that attain, um, apply to an urban forest. First of all, it's the aggregate of all vegetation within an urban area. Makes sense, right? The management of population of trees. Makes sense, right? The intersection of people with biology of urban flora and fauna. Hmm. But my favorite definition of them all is the planting, management, and care of trees in our cities of what might be termed the forest where we live. When I hold up this slide, then all of a sudden the traditional foresters in the room say, oh, we do not do single tree management. Of course, you, any forester will tell you it does matter what's going on with the individual trees and the quality and the diseases and things that are affecting those individual trees. But urban foresters, just like traditional foresters, look at the stand and the management of the city, the community, the neighborhood, the parks as a whole. But that's our stand of trees. So, first of all, we know that in understanding urban forestry, you have to understand the benefits of urban forestry, correct? One of the major benefits of urban forestry is aesthetics. A lot of people just think trees look pretty, point blank. And one example is what you see to my left. This is the same street, one with trees and one without. Now I'm willing to argue that the one up top looks a lot better, right? Now I'd like to ask you a quick question though, you know, just a show of hands or I guess round of applause, whatever you want to do, which one do you think came first? The top picture or the bottom picture? And the people who attended class yesterday can't answer this question. Yes, sir, in the blue shirt. The bottom picture came first, is what he said. Yes, sir, in the red hat? The top picture came first. Anyone else? Okay, so let's do this. Those who think that the top picture came first, just raise your hand. Looks like a great deal of the room in the bottom. Okay, kind of the same, a little bit less. Well, the people who said the top came first are absolutely correct. One thing that we'll talk about and one thing we always preach about in urban areas is monocultures. When you have a stand of trees that are the same species, all you need is one pest or one disease to wipe out the entire stand. So yes, this is what the street looked like at the top before Dutch elm disease came. And that's what it looked like at the bottom afterwards. Now, another thing that we like to talk about is the increased property values that are associated with urban trees. Now, a lot of times I tell people this slide originally doesn't show the price right off of the, of the uh, value of that tree. I usually let people guess and they never really come to this amount. But I do like to tell people also that you're not going to be able to, to do anything to get that money you know, for that tree. So don't go out looking for big trees and cutting them down. You know, I know you forester guys are like, oh, we can really cut that one down if that's what it's worth. No, that's not really how it goes. But basically, trees increase property values from five to 27%. We also know that people will purchase homes or pay more for homes, up to $5,000 more for homes, because it gives them that curb appeal. It gives the, that buyer the uh, perception of a neighborhood, of a home, of being associated with something that's more livable. We also know that trees increase business for business owners. It, it actually increases employees' productivity, morale, their pride in the workplace. Um, it even helps customers who want to find a new, uh, a new place to go visit. They'll look at the outside easily and say, well, let's try that place. It looks kind of neat. And this is actually a restaurant in Houston, Texas. I wanted to go there. It was just a regular hamburger place, but I wanted to go there because it just looked good. You wanted to see what was going on. 
Now, another thing we all know about trees is their ability to moderate temperatures. But it didn't matter as much until people started paying utility bills, especially if uh, you're like me and your, your, your heating is associated with gas. Whoa. Gas goes up and then you're like having a panic attack, okay? Well, basically, trees in, an her in a heat island a uh, situation can reduce temperatures from 20 to 35 uh, degrees just from planting trees. They can reduce summer cooling costs up to 75% and reduce winter heating costs up to 15%. Now, when you start talking about family budgets, economic situations, then you're talking about a situation where you can just plant trees around your home and it make this much of a difference? What about noise and, and, uh, and glare from sun? Noise reduction by seven decibels per 100 feet of, of, of trees, actually. And then it actually masks the white noise caused by man-made sounds. Trees, of course, we all know can reduce stormwater uh, runoff. It either intercepts, slows down, evaporates, or stores stormwater. It reduces the runoff by 2% to every 5% of tree canopy cover, and it reduces erosion on develop, developing and developed landscapes by 95%. Just the trees. They help reduce production of ozone by reducing air temperature. They store 2.6 tons of carbon per acre of trees per year. They generate enough oxygen per acre of trees each day for 18 people. And, it, and in my opinion, or in, or in the research that I do, or in the areas that I speak to people about, because I'm an urban forester, I'm most comfortable with people. I always tell people that the most valuable resource we have in our urban forest are People, the human beings, everything we do with trees in an urban setting is actually set by either rules and regulations set by people, passions or emotions, people's viewpoints, the type of species they want. So people are very important. Well, there are plenty of social and physical benefits of having trees. I'm not going to go into each detail of each one, because I'm sure you guys are capable of actually seeing what's up here, but we're talking about going home up to a day earlier after having an operation because you can view a landscape. We're talking about crime rates going down because people live in landscape buildings versus one right next door that's not landscape because people have a feeling of ownership. This is my home. It looks good. I'm not going to vandalize. If we come together and we start landscaping or planting community gardens outside of this building, now I'm talking to my neighbors and I know who's supposed to be at your home on Wednesday because now we're having conversations where in some urban areas we're all so busy we don't even get the time to talk to people who live right next door. And then let's not talk about worker attitudes and well-being. I know some of y'all feel like that at the end of the day at the bottom. Well, did you know that, you know, a lot of people find their jobs more challenging, which is a good thing if they're able to uh, view landscapes. They're more satisfied with the jobs that they have just because their cubicle is placed close to a window. And in addition, when we're talking about bullying, violence, and aggression in schools, kids actually uh, feel that landscapes that, I mean, schools without landscapes are, more, are scarier to them. They feel that it's more prone to violence. So the things that we can do just by planting trees around buildings, just around exposing our children to nature can change their social and physical being. So why wouldn't we? So today, I plan to establish a basic understanding of the concept of urban forestry, which I hope that I've sort of already done. <laughs> um, we want to identify examples of the interaction between trees and people across the United States. Then we'll actually go to a few areas overseas. And then I'll bring it back to Oregon, and we'll sit and talk and figure out where Oregon fits in in the grand scheme of things. Does that sound good? All right, anybody left behind yet? We need to rewind and catch everybody up? We're good? All right, let's keep going. Every time I bend my head down, it gets louder. It scares me. Like, who, who is that? Sorry, I have really bad allergies. And so the more I talk, the drier I get. And I don't want to start coughing up here. So I'll have to take my little breaks. But um, urban forestry, the federal role of urban forestry. Now, urban forestry as a practice is, you know, it's plenty of debates going on about when did it actually start. 
You know, if you really want to sit and think about it, <laughs> I had a professor one time say, and he's a really, really um, funny guy, and he asked his room of students, what's the oldest profession in the world? See, get your minds out of the gutter. Get your minds out of the gutter. See, in a college campus, which is where he teaches, they blurt out the answer. They're looking for a reason to say what they think it is. Um, but if you think back to the Garden of Eden, they were caring for trees and gardens. Mmm. Interesting concept, huh? Well, when we talk about urban forestry or having an urban forest and planting and planting with trees in mind to be around people, there's debates going back to the Boston Commons, even Central Park. But the federal program did not start till 1978. That's when Congress uh, passed the Cooperative, Cooperative Forestry Assistance Act. And that basically just had the Secretary of Agriculture provide financial, technical, and other assistance to the states across the United States so that they could have an urban forestry program. Well, in 1990, that, uh, the Farm Bill actually extended that. And that then allowed, um, uh, it allowed the federal government to provide funds to establish a network. So at that time, the federal government was then giving money or passing down money so that we would have urban forestry coordinators in each of the 50 states around the United States. They would also have other organizations uh, tied to the Farm Bill, but most importantly, you got this one individual that was employed in every state who was to manage or help promote urban forestry across the United States. Now, there was also the national, um, Paul mentioned the National Urban and Community uh, Urban Forestry Advisory Council. I should get that right. I've sat on it before. But this group um, in the Farm Bill was um, designed to actually be like a granting agency for urban forestry grants from the Secretary of, of Agriculture. So they would review grant proposals and advise the Secretary of Agriculture on funding grants as well as the direction of the urban forestry, the federal urban forestry program. So those are two things that comes out of that. Now to date, Congress is putting roughly $30 million in an urban forestry, a federal urban forestry program. This money in most states trickles straight down to the region. I mean, in most scenarios, trickles straight down to the region. And these are your 10 regions of the U.S. Forest Service. When it gets to those regions, there's a regional coordinator that's sitting there, and then they distribute in various means. There's uh, formulas, there's like an actual uh, foundational money or everybody gets a certain amount of money to just pay salaries and do those, those kind of things and then the rest of the money is given to the state or tied to programs that the states are agreeing to do. But all states receive some level of funding. The remaining budget is based on how well they perform. Basically, so when you see larger urban forestry support from the federal government, it's usually because there's some things happening or there's, uh, there's documented performance measures that are coming from that state to the federal government to help fund those things. Now, what I'd like to do from this point is, we've talked about, okay, the structure, the top-down structure, the definitions, the benefits, et cetera, but let's talk about what we came here for, which was the people. Connecting the people. How does urban forestry bring individuals together? So what I'd like to do is highlight a few states in the United States and programs that were done in you know, the last few years that we can use as examples of collaborations and partnerships in urban forestry. And you can then kind of see if there's a common thread amongst them, okay? First of all, in the state of Texas, there are, um, of course, project funding that happens from that state office. And then there are regional budgets within the region of Texas. We have regional offices and individuals out with salaries and technical expertise, et cetera, across the state of Texas. But there are specific projects that the uh, Texas Forest Service Urban Forestry Program supports. One of the largest programs that just recently happened was the um, Super Bowl planting. Who knew? Or did you know, let's do a show of hands, that the National Football League actually comes in and plants trees to reduce the carbon, input, uh, the carbon footprint of having all of those people migrate to your city. Who knew? You did? I had no idea. 
I think it's a great idea, but I just had no idea that they did this. So basically what happened is the NFL came to the NFL comes to town and says, we're having a football game. And this football game is going to bring millions of people to your city, to your region. In Dallas, Texas, this past year, it affected 12 different communities because there were bedroom communities around Dallas, Fort Worth, Arlington that also housed people and had, you know, infrastructure issues, et cetera, because of all of the people coming into town. So we basically had a partnership between the National Football League, their environmental program, the Texas Trees Foundation, which is a nonprofit, and the Texas Forest Service, which was a state agency. And what those individuals did is that they packaged a tree planting program in all 12 participating cities. It was basically 12 different tree planting programs that, inv that included Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, schools, civics, civic organizations, adults, master gardeners, master naturalists, anybody you could believe. And they planted over 4,000 trees just associated with the Super Bowl. That was a pretty big deal. Now, this, the actual grant was like a $50,000 grant that was done, but if you look at the partnerships that were developed because of such a grant, then we walk away with educating all of these kids on the benefits of trees almost overnight, correct? And it didn't help that they got to meet a football player or two. You had a lot of Pee Wee football teams coming out there. You had a lot of team moms coming out there too. <laughs> um, in addition to that, they also had a tree seedling giveaway that they would give with a group called Slant 45. Slant 45 basically was a group that was targeting schools. And so these individuals would go out and give different uh, seedlings to kids at schools as well. Now in Florida, there was a grant project. Now, Florida's funding is population, population driven. The funding allocation, once it gets to the state, it goes to different pockets of the state based on the population. But it also takes into consideration resource management needs. One of those projects was in Fort Lauderdale. There was an um, organization called the Kids Ecology Corps. The project was like a native ecosystem restoration pro uh, project where they wanted to uh, reintroduce native hardwoods uh, yeah, hardwood stands on local school grounds. And so these kids would go in, they would learn about, you know, proper tree identification, planting, maintenance, management of trees on the property, and then they would organize their own projects at different schools. So it was very much a youth-driven program, but it incorporated education, and, uh, education of how to plan the events, as well as education of how to plant and care for trees. Now, in California, their makeup is a little bit different. In California, but I think things are always a little different in California, right? The funding from uh, California actually would come down to basic salaries, and then it'd go to nonprofits. Now, a lot of what's happened in California or the, the things that are done through um, that are considered urban forestry projects in California are part of an initi initiative process. And what a lot of people don't know is that the citizens of California voted to basically tax themselves in like um, a water bond type of issue, um, um, bond election type of thing. And then that money, you can compete for grants to do different environmental projects across the state of California. So it was a situation where the citizens felt the importance of the environment period and so a lot of urban forestry grants and other, other I guess, more naturally um, environmental grants can come from there, but a large amount of the urban forestry grants come from this initiative process. Uh, one of those is actually one that was under the direction of the California Urban Forestry Council. They actually gathered a group of individuals that they like to call the United Voices for Healthy Communities. And it was actually just a group of individuals and agencies and organizations that wanted to help increase the tree canopy cover. And so in order, the reason they were doing this, of course, was for air quality issues and promoting healthier communities. But they wanted to use science and research and public education, management, and I guess public agency support to get it done. So they were able to, uh, to plant several thousand trees through 25 communities across California just by applying to this one grant and having several tree planting programs happen across the state. 
Now in Michigan, the projects that are focused in Michigan are more towards urban agriculture or vacant lot revitalization. We all know about the flight of individuals away from Detroit, uh, Michigan area, whether it's because of the, um, the auto industry or the economy or what have you. Well, this organization said, well, we're just not going to have it. We have vacant lots in the city of Detroit, so what we're going to do is go take them over. So what they've done is take, they have an agreement with the city where they go onto the property, they clean the lots, they have their own, and we'll talk about the group that goes in, but they have their own core, green core, that goes in, cleans all of these lots out, and then some of them will plant actual uh, trees and make little urban pocket parks in these vacant lots. And some of the others will actually make um, community gardens. Now, the good thing about the community gardens is that it's not just about planting. The uh, garden resource program supports like, I think 200 different communities across the Detroit, Michigan and neighboring community, neighboring um, suburban areas. But it also teaches individuals entrepreneurship because after they grow the community gardens, they have like a farmer's market where they teach them how to then market and package their products then bring the money in, manage their little business plan, and go back to the community garden. So you have individuals that now start kind of like a side produce business, which helps boom the economy, and then gets, I guess, affordable food to different people in lower socioeconomic uh, neighborhoods. So it wasn't just about the vacant lots, it was about building a community. In addition to that, the employees that you see and the people that you see cleaning the lots, et cetera, that's like a green core group. It's over 500 youth that they train during the summer and give them jobs working in various landscape or green jobs across the area. And they basically bring them in and teach them how to clear these lots, plan tree planting events, um, design little pocket parks, and then plant them. So they're doing a job readiness program, and it was so successful that in 2007, they had enough adults that wanted to be a part of it that it, they completely stopped limiting it to just youth. And now it's a year-long program. It happens at several times during the year, but it happens year-long, and um, it's for both youth and adults that want to get into the green industry and don't know how. Now, these individuals don't just work for them, you know, the rest of their lives. They go on to work for nurseries. Some of them go work um, to help with different, um, like, community centers, et cetera. They, they get to apply for entry-level, like, landscape positions after working with this uh, particular group. And last for the United States is, of course, the urban orchards of Boston. Are y'all kind of noticing a theme that's kind of going along the way with what's happening? Well, this group, which has a humorous name to me, is the Boston Tree Party. And the Boston Tree Party actually, you know, is like a, a campaign to plant these heirloom apple trees in the greater Boston area. Now, this is them establishing partnerships with the neighborhood, a diverse range of institutions, organizations, businesses, and communities to get this going. But just like the original Boston Tea Party, the Boston Tree Party is somewhat of a symbolic political act. The project is taking a stand for universal access to fresh, healthy food for greening cities and cleaning the air for, and waterways, reducing the city's carbon footprint and creating a habitat for urban wildlife. Now, the issue is that these people are planting these trees in lower socioeconomic neighborhoods so people can then go out and eat. I mean, not that they would just survive off of apples, but the whole point is to start teaching individuals about urban orchards and urban agriculture and producing your own foods so there's no more limitations to healthy foods based on someone's socioeconomic situation. They're trying to al alleviate that altogether. And so it's actually that, you know, these people have taken, you know, I guess a project and, it, and greatly increased the tree canopy of Boston by just what they consider a political act, or them being just tired of people not having a fair way to get food to other citizens. So with that being said, now we can go abroad. Now when we talk about urban forestry abroad, of course, 
the funding sources are very diverse. Um, in a lot of the people, the groups that I'll talk about, um, these are groups, and I specifically chose these particular pro uh, projects because you can actually see where the money's going. Um, all of them are nonprofits. Some of them have some governmental ties, et cetera. But for the most part, the sources of funds are donations, uh, governmental stuff, grants, et cetera. So it's extremely diverse. It's not a streamline like you see in the United States. Um, and then, two, I think, like the United States, um, I mean, unlike the United States, there's different reasons for planting. Um, and we'll get to that in a second, but it, they're similar, but there are differences in why. Now, the Africa, in Africa in particular, I like to tell people all the time, I was speaking to a colleague of mine from Nigeria, and I was talking to him about community forestry. Because for a long period of time where I was working in Texas, I would have people say, well, you know what? You cover the entire state of Texas, so you cannot talk urban forestry you're going to have to talk urban and community forestry because all of your, you know, all of the people, the citizens of the state of Texas don't live in urban areas. So what we would like for you to do is express yourself as community forestry. So I'm talking to these people and I said, well, let's talk community forestry. What does it look like in your country? Well, little did I know, community forestry means a totally different thing in some countries in Africa. In particular, it's because a community forest could be a traditional forest, like many people in Oregon understand, but the resources from this forest go to the community. So you may have a certified stand or acres of trees that are harvested and cut down, and then the resources that come from it go back to this community. That's not what I was meaning. So we were actually sitting there talking, and I'm like, really? And you cut down the trees? <laughs> but needless to say, we, we got it together after a while. And there is urban forestry in these areas of Africa. But you have to be specific in saying urban forestry or tree planting instead of, I mean, tree planting programs instead of community forestry. Because they're two totally different things. They're not interchangeable like they are in the United States. Now, in 1998, the UN released data about urban populations across the globe. The new millennium, it said, will be an urban millennium. Urban areas in developing countries will account for nearly 90% of the projected world population. That's an increase of 2 billion, 700 million people between 1995 and 2030. Wow. By the year 2030, almost 85% of Latin Americans and 50% of all Africans and Asians will live in cities. The most explosive urban growth is expected in Africa and Asia. Asia, and this is the part they got me, will have the largest urban population in the world with almost twice as many people living in cities as in Africa and Latin America combined. Wow. Okay, so when we start talking about that many people in an urban area, and we talked about what the benefits of urban forestry are, do we now understand why it's important to start making sure that people understand that planting trees and pocket parks and community gardens and, you know, these little small uh, areas to revitalize communities is important, not just in the United States, but abroad? In 1990, there were a group of concerned citizens in Africa who came together um, basically to, to deal with an environmental crisis. The country, uh, the country had realized that there was stuff going on, but that the, the real crisis was to the people. They needed to uplift the quality of life and address climate change. But they recognized that a simple way of achieving this was through the greening of unhealthy, denuded, and degraded landscapes. That was the birth of the Food and Trees for Africa organization. It was one of the first, and I think it might be still one of the only social enterprise that develops, promotes, and facilitates greening, climate change action, food security, and sustainable natural resource use and management in Africa, or in South Africa. Africa, I'm sorry, in South Africa. Trees for Homes is the program. Now, the Trees for Home program actually is a public greening initiative. 
You'll have people contribute nationally in a visible way to more sustainable settlements. So you're having people still coming together, learning about planting trees and, and maintenancing trees and everything, and then going back and actually planting these trees in their settlements. They started in 2000, I guess, to address the climate change and improve the quality of life or what have you by giving low-income communities fruit or indigenous trees to plant at their home as well as providing training, some short-term paid employment, and environmental awareness in these particular communities. Does that sound familiar at all to any other organizations we've talked about? Now, um, let's go back for a second. This particular program had a significant interest across South Africa, but it came from the government, nonprofits, and of course the public sectors and media of all people were very interested in looking at the success of this program because they realized that there was now a demand for trees and settlements where people normally were worried about food. People wanted to make their homes and where they were sleeping look better. Of course, some of the trees were fruiting trees, but you got to understand that when we start talking about the, the psychological changes that happen when people have green areas around them, then you understand the importance for people that are living in settlements to then want to beautify where they are, regardless of what basic needs we as Americans think that someone else may have. Now, in China, things are a little bit different. Um, there has, of course, been a rapid urbanization of China as a country. And, um, you know, it's due to increasing economic development. You know, there's been research that's been done. A, a lot of the urban forestry movement in China is like speeding up and coming today. There's a journal now of urban forestry in China. I mean, it's different things that are happening. There are a lot of urban forestry programs in China now at colleges across the country. So urban forestry in China is more or less taking a fast, fast, uh, faster pace. But just like we would, I guess, assume in China, a lot of the urban forestry is centered around the culture, the history of the country, and then there are some regulations. Did you know that in 1981, a decision by the National People's Congress said that citizens from China, from ages 11 to 55, should plant three to five trees every year as a way to increase China's overall forest coverage. Period, point blank, end of discussion. I love it. <laughs> I think we should do that here now. <laughs> Let's start a movement. Now, in um, every government age, uh, employee in, Beij in Beijing must plant and maintain two trees per year in the mountains. So again, I'm a governmental employee, so I guess I'd have my two trees plus my other trees. Wow. So I might as well just plant a little park outside of my house or something and satisfy all of the requirements. But the government is so interested in rekindling and modifying the traditional tree customs that they also set land aside to encourage the planting of trees to commemorate marriages, births, deaths. I mean, Ever since the early 90s, this has been happening through the government imposing these requirements on the people who live in, in the country. Now, of course, the urban forest in Beijing, you know, can be explained or better understood when you start talking about the cultural and traditional species of the trees that are there, the planting practices and the choices of various species since the 40s, and um, of course, the effects of the land use, the age of the houses, that kind of thing, where we've seen in uh, Beijing in particular, they've taken some of the sprawled residential areas actually torn them down, put the multifamily complexes up, and replaced homes, single-family homes, with parks. Now, I don't know what y'all are used to here in Portland, but that never happens in Texas. It's almost the exact opposite. You know, you see a beautiful area, green space, and next thing you know, it's a 
condominium high rise or a residential neighborhood of many mansions stacked on top of each other or side by side. So I thought this is actually great. I don't know about the governmental regulations to make it happen, but it's a great idea. Now, um, they, they, I think that their government should be given some merit because they've, they've actually concentrated their effort on growing space to plant trees to improve the quality of life for the people who live in that particular area. Now again, we're talking about the psychological benefits. We're talking about the social benefits. But we're talking about somebody coming in and recognizing how important that is and now asking people to change their way of life to then divert the ownership of land to promote the planting of trees or parks to commemorate things like, you know, weddings. I mean, I've been to a few weddings in my lifetime and we've never gone out and planted a tree afterwards. We have fun, but we never plant trees. <laughs> now in Brazil, you'll see a lot of deforestation happening. And so, Costa Rica had the worst of all. When, when um, a measurement was done, I think, by the United Nations or someone, they looked at the deforestation that was happening across Latin American countries, et cetera, and Costa Rica got the lowest score. They actually had the most deforestation, the, low, the worst deforestation rate of all of Latin America in the 90s. So the government then made, uh, made it public that they were going to reverse this. And um, what they did was they actually um, created a program for that purpose. Um, it's called the Ecological Blue Flag. And if, in order to get that ecological blue flag, there are a lot of guidelines that you have to set in place. But one of those things is planting a certain percentage of trees in an urban area. And they actually start paying individuals or paying the communities or the cities that become an ecological blue flag for the resources that they have. So if you, you know, dispose of waste a certain way, you improve security and health and plant trees in a certain community, you actually can get funding from the government to your city because you've now reversed the, the deforestation that's happening in that country. I think that's great. I think that if we were to say, hey, you'll, we'll start paying you to plant trees in your yard, we wouldn't have the problem that we're having today, correct? So with that, let's try to bring it back to Oregon. Oh, I'm sorry. What we see in this area are tree ordinances that have started up that require people to go through a great deal of trouble if they want to remove a tree from their own yard, their own property, as opposed to public property. What that has had, I believe, is a chilling effect on people planting trees. Those landowners no longer wish to plant trees, and that's the flaw of those tree ordinances. Have you seen that as a problem? And can you speak to disincentives and incentives in planting trees? Well, that's, that's a loaded question, actually, because I have the city foresters sitting in the room, so it's, <laughs> it gets interesting. How do I answer this? Well, we do not, let's see, I want to make sure I'm correct. I know that in most of the municipalities that I have worked with in the state of Texas, we do not regulate what happens on private property. However, we do have um, requirements. If, if on the private property you are adding a certain percentage of impervious um, pavement to the property, you kick in the ordinance and then you're required to maybe plant more trees on your property than you had before because there's a required amount of trees at a certain you know, place based on the landscape ordinance and you would trigger that. Um, as far as removal is concerned, we really don't regulate that on the private property, but on public property, there are fines set in place. There are mitigation standards that are set in place. So if a developer comes in and cuts down trees, he's going to have to pay for, you know, pay a certain amount per inch diameter of the trees he took down if they're protected species. And in other areas, they may have to then plant back on that same lot the same amount of inches of an approved species. 
species. I'm not sure if someone here from one of the cities wants to speak to the private property issue here, but I would yield to that if somebody wanted to address it. If not, we definitely can discuss it after the presentation because that's just something that we haven't dealt with. Yes, sir. One second, the mic's coming to you. I'm not entirely sure, but he might be talking about trees on the uh, parking strips. No, 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 no. What, I, okay. what I'm talking about is I've observed out in Lake Oswego and counted them. People, uh, private landowners are on, the, on their own property have largely stopped planting at least Douglas fir. Now, I can show easily correlation with the time of the tree ordinance. Whether there's causation, I don't know, but the penalties for having trees burden the landowners and therefore I think that they're not planting trees as a reaction to the tree ordinances which arithmetically destroys the urban forest. Okay, See, just I wanted to check that. I don't, I, I mean, and I don't know the situation, that's why I hate to speak to it, but I just really don't see that being a reason not to plant trees. I think it's a reason, it would be a reason to pay attention to the types of trees that you have, the value of mature trees on your property, and to hold you accountable to plant trees back if you remove trees. But I just don't see it being a reason that someone would not plant trees at all on their property. But I mean, again, that's just me speaking. Yeah, that's just me speaking. And with me not being from Portland, I'm not really sure. Okay, but let's go. Any other questions? All right, so let's go and bring it back to Oregon. So we talked about Texas and California and Michigan and, you know, Boston, and then we went over to Africa, and then we talked about China and Brazil, and you're kind of sitting there like, okay, these programs seem really good, but what does that mean for Oregon? Where does that put Oregon? So what I thought I'd do today is kind of talk about the urban forestry program in Oregon and then at the very end we'll kind of see what we where we think Oregon stands okay first of all Oregon of course you all know has 242 cities 2.7 million of Oregon's 3.4 million people live in these cities and in urbanized unincorporated areas Oregon is definitely a rural state but in population distribution terms, it has some real urban or rural urban splits. Uh, it's the same as some states, rural urban split states like Pennsylvania, what have you, because you have a large amount of people. Portland is an urban metropolitan area, period, even though it's in a rural state. So you're gonna have some of the same issues that we would have in some cities in Texas because of the population that you have in this one city. Um, not that it's the only city, but I'm just using it as an example. Um, so back in 2004, the, um, I guess, o Oregon Department of Forestry did a survey. And the survey was a city survey to kind of assess what was going on with urban forestry programs across the state of Oregon. And so it actually, they, they surveyed what, 123 or 51% of those 240 something cities responded. And the respondent cities account for actually 1.9 million people or 80% of Oregon's population. So 37% of the cities that were surveyed have tree planting and care programs. That's pretty good because that's an increase from 92. Uh, a large over 50% have tree ordinances, which is great because that was under 42, I mean under 50% just in 92. 56% of those cities have tree inventories, which is also an increase. And the same thing for your tree advisory committees, but only 9% of those cities have a management plan. We also saw that $7.8 million was spent on urban forestry activities in 2003 when it was 1.2 just in 92. Now the concern in most of these areas are hazard trees followed by root conflicts and tree preservation. Now the primary reasons that cities manage trees, of course, aesthetics, decrease hazards from trees, and promote business development. So it's kind of those things that we discussed a little bit earlier about the benefits of trees. 
But one thing that I wanted to show was that in 2010, they looked at the achievements of the or uh, the Oregon Urban Forestry Program between 1990 and 2010, and look, you're up 244% for your Tree City USA cities. To me, that's, that's very similar to your ecological blue flag program of Brazil, except you're not getting paid for it. <laughs> Your local urban forestry expenditures have increased by 376%. You have a 706% change in the cities providing urban forestry assistance. So that's how many cities have called and said, we need this help on something with urban forestry. That's how many people, before only 60 people even called and said, we need assistance in how to do this, Techni uh, technical assistance, how to do an inventory, how to make a management plan, et cetera. Now all of a sudden there are 129 different communities asking for this. And these are communities, not individuals. You have now 74 different tree advisory boards. Um, the cities with professional urban forestry staff, 101, and that is very good for a state, like Oregon especially. And then, of course, you see the rest, especially the tree ordinances, up 505%. Now, in Oregon, there are actually some programs that I think have similar, I guess, missions as some of the ones we mentioned earlier. One of them was done by the Eugene Tree, Tree Foundation. It was the Trees to Concrete program. It was actually a partnership with nonprofits and businesses where they would take in, they would partner with businesses that had basically all concrete lots. And the nonprofit would or, uh, organization would go in, break up some of the concrete areas, and put this in. Now, when we talk about the benefits of trees and businesses and how people now want to be tenants of buildings with better landscape, people want to purchase items from places that are better landscape, it's even known that people shop longer in, uh, along streets that are landscaped than ones that aren't. So if we know this, I know business owners in Eugene didn't take long before they jumped on this opportunity. And of course, it doesn't look bad as far as the livability of that neighborhood or the area around it. Another program that was good is the um, Friends of Trees nonprofit had a school trees program. And this one was, I mean, we talk about how kids view certain, tr uh, certain schools to be violent or to promote violence if it's not landscaped. Well, this was one of those schools that had concrete going right up to the building. Now, if we want to step outside of just how the psychological benefits may have uh, impacted those students, let's look at the heating and cooling cost of a school with concrete up against it. And then I want to make you think about this. Do y'all have standardized testing for kids in Portland? Every year they take some kind of exit exam or something to measure where they are, what have you. Now, if we have students and we know that looking outside of a window helps people heal faster, it makes people in work, workplaces feel more challenged and enjoy their workplace. We know all of these benefits of having trees or views of trees outside of a window. When are we gonna think about test scores? and how much higher kids may score if they can look out of the window and see a well-landscaped lawn in front of their school. And then why do we have to limit that to certain schools in, uh, in um, specific socioeconomic areas? Why can't we give that to all of our kids? So this particular nonprofit organization would come in and partner with schools, and this is exactly what they do. They'd break up the concrete, then they get the kids involved. We don't need a bunch of employees. We're going to make sure that we have this feeling of ownership. Remember we talked about that when we talked about the reduction in vandalism because people now feel ownership to the property that they're in. So let's involve the, the people who are going to be in this school, the kids, because they're least likely to tear it up if they helped to plant it. And now all of a sudden, this area that was concrete and right up against their wall started out looking like this kids helping to plant things, and now look at what you have.
So the last thing we'll talk about, excuse me, is the concept of impervious surfaces and then uh, pervious surfaces. How many of you guys have heard of swales? Oh, well then I don't even need to show this video. I mean, this, this page. Somebody out here wants to come up and talk about this? <laughs> but basically, this is just, um, I'm going to just not even walk people through it, but you, I mean, I'm sure everybody even that's on the internet can actually look at the slide and understand that we're talking about the benefits of actually allowing uh, water to naturally filtrate through the soil versus go into a, a piping system or some kind of concrete system underground. Well, in uh, Seattle, there was a street edge alternative design for storm water conveyance. And so the before picture is the picture that you'll see to your left and the after is to the right. Now the street originally was just straight with underground piping and everything else just basically kind of boring in a sense. And to the right is where they went in and they started to put in these bioswales. So a street that started off looking like this with the infrastructure built in, with high temperatures of water, et cetera, going into this system that would then take pollutants with it into some water treatment plant, became this, that would naturally filter itself and go down into the groundwater system and be filtered by the time it get there with lower temperatures and everything. Now you're wondering, well, why are you even telling us about Seattle, right? Because Seattle was basically what then interest Portland's Bureau of Environmental Services to start their Grade to Green program. So now there are 80,000 trees over five years that are going to be planting them, I guess, cheaper than building more, um, more pipes underground, but they're going to be planting them in bioswell type of situation or swell situations across Portland. So when we talk about where does Oregon fit in, I kind of want to yield to you because I'm not like the, the principal of the school or, the, or the, the instructor that came along with this big report card to say that Oregon's doing well and not doing well. But when we talk about the benefits of urban forestry, when we talk about what's being done in the Northeast, the Southeast, the, 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 the Gulf South, Midwest, when we talk about all of the pro programs, you know, across the United States that are being highlighted, when we talk about Africa, China, Brazil, the programs that the UN is recognizing and people are bragging about, I believe, and you can let me know what you think, that Oregon is basically connected to all of them. In the state of Oregon, you see a component of each of those individual pro projects happening right here in your state. So without me, I mean, you know, I can deem myself president of the, I mean, principal of the school of thought for today. And I'll say that Oregon gets an A plus because Oregon is actually following the research methods that are going on now. They're looking at the results of the latest research and then implementing these things across the state, regardless of whether people consider the state rural or not. It is actually respecting the needs of the urban dwellers in the state. And then when we plant trees and we, we increase the canopy and we filter the air, it's not like the air just stops here in Portland, correct? So needless to say, I think I'd love to stand here and just say well done, hats off to you guys because Oregon has done a great job. Thank you. Are there any questions? Melanie, hi. I'm Dave McAllister and I'm uh, Portland City Forester here, so welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank um, you. The challenge that we see, uh, we love tree planting programs, but the, the challenge is the long-term maintenance of those trees. Mm. So just as we look at our gray infrastructure and we capitalize those costs, we book them as assets, we're not doing that for our green infrastructure. And consequently, our ability to manage that asset is compromised. Mm. 
So what's your thoughts? What are you hearing around the nation? And how can we better address that challenge? One thing that I did not touch on that I probably should have is that in all of the tree planting programs that I mentioned, especially like the Super Bowl one or whatever, the communities that involved have to make an agreement to maintain the trees. So watering, pruning, et cetera. So that's a part of the deal before a tree planting program is even implemented in any of these situations, that the person receiving the trees agrees to maintain them. But my thing is that as, as a city uh, employee, sometimes, and, and the government employee period, sometimes we take for granted that people don't want to do that. So we nip it immediately. We'll say, oh, they're never going to do that. They're never going to assume that role, et cetera. So maybe if, if you were to then implement a policy that will plant the trees, you know, adjacent to your property or in, you know, in this park area of your neighborhood, if the homeowners association agrees to pay for the irrigation costs and the maintenance. Or the city services becomes like a contract basis. We'll maintenance it if the homeowners association would pay X amount of dollars a year for us to come in and prune in a, you know, not per year, but in a cycle. But start thinking of creative ways to include maintenance in giving the trees to the individual, whether they assume it or whether it's like a contractual basis that you all do it as a city. I think just being creative in, in, in including the maintenance costs into you giving the trees is the only way to go. Yes. Can I have a follow-up question mm -hmm. here? So uh, in Portland, one of the things I also manage is about 8,000 acres of natural areas, which has got a lot of trees. Forest Park you visited today okay. was one of those. Okay. Now, there's nothing like that that I've ever All seen right. before, so I can't compare anything. That so those trees are already there. Yes. And what I guess I'm really trying to, to grapple with is that we, we, we book our assets of bridges. We book our assets on our roads and we say those are important for the viability of our city we take for granted those trees that are reducing our stormwater costs in mm -hmm. fact that's how we we've learned to to monetize those costs and various valuations so we seem to say oh we take all those benefits of trees we take all those benefits from uh, our green spaces and we say they don't have any value and we're doing a disservice to the green asset in the long-term management of those. And we're sort of, in my mind, you know, it's a bigger question of the way uh, GASB treats, uh, treats city assets, which is a, it's an evaluation um, uh, that the government makes all cities go, go through to book their assets and be able to show accountability. And we frankly have not addressed our green infrastructure. So many of the things you're seeing today can be talked about as capitalized assets in the short term. You, you build it and then it's there. Mm -hmm. But how you amortize those costs of long-term maintenance and say the city, what is your responsibility of those assets? We are doing a very dismal job. And I think that's the challenge of urban forestry in the forthcoming years is to be able to address that question, get to our congressmen, get to the people that are making those decisions and the bean counters because they're the ones who are saying, I'm used to a depreciating asset. I'm used to a bridge that goes down in value over a 30-year period. Our trees are increasing their value. They have more benefit as they get older than mm -hmm. they get younger. And we haven't done a good job of actually addressing that question. And so that's, that's our challenge. I agree with you. Let me say, yes, you're right. If that was a question, yes. <laughs> but um, I also want to say there are other resources out there. Um, and I'm looking to Paul now. Is it McPherson's group that has this study where they look at the age of the tree? And um, as the tree gets older, it actually shows the environmental benefits of the tree and how they progress over time. So I think what, what we forget to do as urban foresters or as green professionals is we forget to use those types of tools when we're talking to decision makers. I think that, you know, like Kathleen Wolf did research on transportation and trees and talked about how long or how trees shading streets reduces the amount of time you have to go in and actually fix these streets. So they talked about the cost in public works going down because the streets are shaded. Well, it didn't make sense to public works until you say that. So we have to now be smart enough to arm ourselves with, I mean, we have a passion. We're sitting in this room because we care. 
We care about the environment. We care about trees. We care, we, we care about something. Maybe we just care about breathing every day some fresh air. Who knows? But we have to not assume that people understand or have that same passion. And we don't need to mistake them not understanding for them not caring. A lot of times it's the lack of exposure, you know, and I hate to say ignorance, but it's, it's the fact that a person does not know is the reason that they're not doing, rather than they're just intentionally not doing something. You know what I'm saying? So we have to find a way to start talking to the city planners, the city engineers, you know, these individuals, but speaking their language, showing them that, yes, you spend X amount of dollars correcting streets or repairing streets because of whatever. If we were to plant trees that shade the, tr shade the streets, you don't have to actually correct it as often. If we start talking that way, then we can start getting them to see. If we want them to see that long-term benefit that trees have and how trees actually increase in value over time, let's start getting these images of a tree canopy in our city, put it into the actual data analysis that the U.S. Forest Service gives us for free, and then let's start getting these numbers. And then let's start putting this hard science in front of people and say, here, this is what the researchers say. I'm not making it up. So this is why I'm going to put it in my report as a resource that increases in value instead of decreases. So that's my thought. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, howdy, Dr. Kirk. Howdy. <laughs> Is there a relationship between trees, the absence or, or presence of trees in urban areas and people in p population, people in urban areas thinking of forests in, in rural areas, national forests, <laughs> national parks? I would like to say that there is, but it's shown that it's not necessarily that the case. Um, we were talking about this, I think, the other night. I don't remember who I was, or the other day, who I was talking to, but there's been, mostly the research is done with kids, but they talk about kids in urban areas and their understanding of, of nature and wilderness, et cetera. And because they see trees in an urban area, that doesn't necessarily have them thinking towards traditional forests, but it does give them a better respect for nature or traditional forest. I still think that there's value in putting kids on the bus from school one day and taking them out in the woods and letting them see what it looks like. I mean, I couldn't even fathom not having those types of hands-on exploratory experiences while I was in grade school because those individuals, the individuals who grow up to become the voters, the decision makers, the individuals in urban areas that can make decisions about whether it's traditional forest or urban forest. So I think it's valuable, yes. But um, is there a direct correlation as far as I know of? There's no research that's been done that say that people see trees in urban areas and immediately have a direct link to traditional forest because a lot of times they, they don't even understand it. Now, I'm sure in Oregon kids do, you know, but in Texas, no. Um, there was a researcher, Corliss Outley, and she did a um, study with, with kids where she gave them all disposable cameras. And she sent them home and she told them, go back in your neighborhoods and take pictures of nature. All right? At the beginning of this research project, it was her dissertation, at the beginning of the research project, she, they, she, they brought back pictures of roaches, vacant lots. You know, that was nature to them. But then she took them through like a summer wilderness type of camp and then gave them a camera and had them do it again. And they had a totally different understanding. So again, I think that sometimes it's, it's us having to expose people to it to get them to understand, and they don't necessarily make the linkage between urban and traditional. Not automatically. Yes. I have one. Today you were talking earlier about uh, master stewards, forest stewards program Tree that's stewards. volunteers mm -hmm. through the Extension Service that work with urban people. Could mm -hmm. you talk about that a little? Yeah, there's actually two different programs in Texas that are very similar, but they're just um, housed in different 
uh, agencies. Um, Agri Texas AgriLife Extension, we actually have a program for master gardeners, and it's a master gardener specialization program. So this person has already been a master gardener, has completed all the hours to be an official master gardener in that county, and then they'll attend a three-day training that's specifically about landscape trees. We talk about diseases, hazards, identification, right tree, right place, benefits, I mean, anything, it's just basically a, 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 a urban forestry little institute for master gardeners and then they're required to complete 40 additional volunteer hours before being deemed a tree steward so then that's the individual in that county because I'm a basically I cover the state of Texas now I don't know how many of y'all have been to Texas but I am it when it comes to urban forestry <laughs> extension in the state so needless to say I can spend most of my time in airplanes or, or in a car driving all over the state just to have an hour meeting if I don't build this little army of assistants for, me, for myself. And so that's what the tree stewards have become. If someone calls me in Dallas and they have a question about something in Fort Bend, which is south of Houston, I can, to the best of my knowledge, answer that question. But if that homeowner needs someone to come to their home, instead of me trying to drive or fly or get to them, I can easily call the tree steward from that area. And I know at least that person has the base basic foundation of information about landscape trees that they can go assist. Now, we do, not, um, we do not arm them or pretend that they are certified arborists or consulting foresters or anything like that. We've taught them that when it gets to a certain point, that's when you call in the certified individuals to do it. And so they also know how to do that. And so we've basically just created an informed group of citizens. Now, the second program is called Citizen Foresters. The Citizen Forester program is done through municipalities. One is in Dallas, one is in Fort Worth, and those are the two that we have right now. Um, there is a discussion about having the Citizen Forester program around the Metroplex of the of DFW area, and basically it's, it's kind of the same thing, except you don't have to be a master gardener. It's just any citizen who wants to come, and those are actually like, it's six months of classes, but it's like one, one evening every month or something, so it might be six meetings that they'll go to, and they'll do the same kind of trainings, and then they'll do volunteer hours, but those individuals will more or less um, become assistants for the city forester, so they learn how to do inventories. They learn how to go and do hazard assessments somewhat so they can at least let the city forester know, I saw this in the park and you need to go look at it. So it's kind of different, but you know, the same in, the, in, in actually educating a group of citizens to, to help us with managing trees. Dr. Kirk? Yes. We've got a comment from the live stream chat room. Uh, Tree Peeps says, Friends of Trees is actually addressing the issue of capitalizing trees. We have joined with Alliance for Community Trees to meet with Oregon's congressional delegation about this topic, and conversations have been underway with the city of Portland, Oregon. And we're partnering with Oregon Department of Transportation and Metro to green the I-205 multi-use path with capitalizing trees as a key component. Okay, so that's actually um, helping you with your question. Thank, tell that person, thank you. Okay. <laughs> well, I guess they can hear me. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Hi, Melanie. Rick Zen with the World Forestry Center. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I heard uh, driving uh, yesterday uh, an unnamed uh, multinational corporation uh, was giving millions of dollars away to plant trees in some undetermined location uh, as a green uh, greening of the company. Um, yet that same corporation has retail outlets <laughs> in this community that are some of the most hideous uh, environmental places uh, around. Can you identify, I mean, even if they spent a few of those dollars on their own property, um, it would make uh, massive improvements. Do you have some examples of some companies that are practicing what they preach? Oh, okay, I thought you were gonna have me identify the ones that are not. I was like, you're not getting me in trouble. I love to shop and I'm not about to get banned from anybody. I'm just playing. No, um, actually, yes. Um, in McKinney, Texas, Walmart did a green development. Now, I'm not sure how many others they have, but I thought that they were supposed to do more across the United States, but the, the, um, the actual, um, 
see, just because early today on the tour we had the pervious, impervious discussion, now I'm confused. The pervious pavers that they put in the parking lot, and, and it's like for each square footage they plant so many trees, et cetera. So you do have, I mean, I'm not gonna say that every Walmart is done that way, but you do have companies who attempt to do the right thing, but they just, they try it in different places to see does it affect the shopping, does it affect, you know, how many people, how much time people spend at their store, et cetera. Um, let's see, the right things. That's the one that really comes to mind because Walmart, I think, usually gets a bad name because they usually, you know, people always accuse them of coming in and just dropping down in the community. So I like to say that they actually do do some of these little pocket ones correctly. So you can look into that one. But, um, yeah, off the top of my head, I can't think of one. Of course, I'll probably think of about five by the time this is over. So I'll definitely let you know. And if anybody else needs to know, we can type it somewhere or post it somewhere later. But with that, with me saying that, that there are a lot of places that do right, okay? The problem that I have is when they do right, we don't support them. We, we as stewards of the land or, or educated individuals in the benefits of doing green development don't raise as much noise about the people who do it right as we do about the people who do it wrong. And I think that if we took the time, you know, you have people who chain themselves to trees so that people won't take them down, but they won't come and participate with a tree planting program, you know? So I think that if we were to do letters to the editor and high five people who are doing developments correctly, then maybe those individuals would be more inclined to, to duplicate those programs in other places. So, you know, I don't have a suggestion right now but I, uh, about who is doing it right, but I do suggest that when someone do it, does it right and you identify that they've done it correctly or you like what they've done, show them recognition some kind of way. Letter to the editor. I mean, even if you're just writing, you know, the developer who did the project. Or if you're sharing with other people about or inviting that person to your, um, your actual um, urban forestry co conference. I know there's supposed to be one here in, in June. You know, why not invite someone to a developer who has done it right to come and talk and, you know, recognize that his work is done? Um, I'm Gabriel Salakov, an international fellow for World Forestry Institute. Our, the topic uh, you presented sounds very interesting, uh, urban forestry. Uh, but I want to present a scenario. Since you talk about the global perspective and you do mention some uh, countries of Asia, Africa, uh, I want to present a scenario concerning especially Africa, like uh, Nigeria, where I come from. Uh, there are certain challenges which I want to present and I see how maybe your advice or what you can do. Uh, there's a problem or a conflict between the issue of uh, environmental management and economic development, especially in Africa. Uh, when you are talking about urban forestry, like the last presenter which uh, presented, uh, uh, he made one uh, uh, very concrete uh, revelations that uh, the greater deforestation is taking place in Africa and uh, I mean, Latin America currently now. Uh, in a situation where, for instance, uh, in Lagos, uh, which is the commercial capital city of Nigeria, forest trees are being cut away to give away for shops and uh, commercial centers, even some uh, wet, I mean, uh, lagoons has been sand filled in order to create room for economic activities because they believe they value that one better. And now, in such a situation, thinking of urban forestry is a great challenge. Uh, alternatively, uh, the present capital of Nigeria, which is Abuja now, uh, there is uh, this concept of urban forestry which is being uh, practiced in the city center. But unfortunately, you discover that uh, a lot of people are being taken away from the city centers. The city center where you have urban for you have trees grown there, you don't even see people, there's only offices. It's like people are cut away. Where the people stay, there are no forests, no trees there. So these are the challenges we have, especially in Africa. And how do you think this urban forestry concept will be able to work in Africa? You know, it's funny that you say that I have a um, a friend named Neka Okafor 
who's from Nigeria as well, and she talked to me about the same thing. Her interest was more along the lines of traditional ag products and um, production agriculture and crops, et cetera, and she, um, her concern was that a lot of people just don't care. Um, and so I don't have an answer to how, to how to get people to understand the value of urban forestry, especially in a city as huge as Lagos. But I do think that if there was a group of individuals, whether it was a coalition of students or whomever, that took pockets of the city and would just do a development or landscape, a building or a block, et cetera, and let people see how it looks and that it, it's not additional cost, et cetera, associated. Well, it's some additional cost to get it started, but the, co the benefits outweigh the costs then I think that it would be more of a word of mouth thing to implement. She, you know, I talked to her about the possibility of getting grants to start doing stuff, you know, international grants or governmental grants to start doing some projects or what have you. And she was not, she was not sure that that would be supported on that level in Nigeria. But I mean, I just, I 100% feel that it's going to be more of a grassroots effort where somebody's going to have to go in and just do it for somebody to see. I mean, you can talk and talk and talk about what can be done, but until somebody sees how it's done, then they don't do it. I mean, even if we talk about, you know, we talk about swells, we talk about gray to green, we talk about all of these concepts, there was already benefits saying that these are the things that would benefit you and this is why trees are important. People didn't go do that until they saw that someone had done it already. So, you know, my suggestion to you is to go back. You will, you will need to find a funder or a business who would pay for you guys to do it. Get a group of, you know, activists, uh, college students, whomever, who are actually as, as ener energized and, you know, dedicated to the environment as you are. And then go in and just try it for a block. You know, plant some stuff for a block and see what happens. Last question. <laughs> uh, Melanie, one of the one of your slides had, or several of the slides, I guess, um, had to do with the survey that I think Paul Reese was responsible for doing for amongst um, towns and cities here in Oregon. One of the things that jumped out at me on that in that series of slides was the, the very low level of management planning that's being done, 9% um, or something like that of the, <clears throat> and my question has to do with how does that equate to what you, your experience is in Texas? Of course, it's, it seems like it's a um, relatively easy thing to get people fired up about going out and planting some trees. I mean, that's fun, that feels good, but mm -hmm. it's a, people are less likely um, to want to think about how do we manage this force on into the future, which is really critical. Right, what's more, most important. What we see um, in Texas is um, originally there was a, a large, I guess, um, push. Various cities were doing inventories. And so everybody was interested in, you know, using this software, that software, this equipment, or that equipment to get the inventory data. And so basically, we were kind of smart in guiding the various uh, municipal foresters in that way because in the workshops that we were doing, we focused on inventory because everybody was doing them. So we had people come in and talk about all the great inventory tools that you can use. And then we went right into management plans and started talking about how to develop a management plan. Here are some management plans that are used for campuses versus cities. Um, we were lucky too that that year the Municipal Forestry Institute had come to Texas, so a lot of people received like a little mini training on management plans and the importance and then the data that you can take from there to help you drive policy. So I think that um, once the foresters across the state, the urban foresters or the city foresters across the state start to see that, okay, inventory is good to have, but until we tie it to something, I mean, once we know what we have, we have to figure out what to do with it. So they have to see that it is a nat nat natural progression as the next step. And until we get every one of your colleagues to understand that the management plan is just the next step, then I don't think it will be successful. So you have to think now promoting inventory, management plan, 
you know, bam. You know, even to the extent of, I know in, in Texas, you're not gonna get money for a tree planting program unless it's associated with some management plan or maintenance agreement, et cetera, because they need to know what do you plan to do with this <coughs> later on down the road. Even with the Super Bowl planting that was done, those places had already been identified as places that needed to have trees because the person, those communities already had an inventory and a management plan set in place. So these are areas that were already identified as areas they wanted to plant trees prior to being given the funds to do so. All right. Help me thank Melanie. <laughs> And she will be sticking around. We have a reception just out in the lobby, but just a couple announcements before we do that. Good. One is there's handouts about the uh, Urban and Community Forestry Conference, um, Community Trees for Healthy Streams, which will be held in this room on Thursday, June 2nd. So keynote speaker, Dr. Susan Day, Urban Forestry Protect Professor from Virginia Tech. There's handouts on the back table. Also on the back table is sign-up sheets for, uh-oh, wrong button. Sign-up sheets for SAF continuing education credits. I apologize that we didn't get ISA credits, International Society of Arbor Arboriculturists, but if you sign the SAF sheet, we will send that to ISA also and cross our fingers, and they've been pretty good. So please do that if, if you are ISA certified. And I got to think this was ISA certified quality talk. So thank you all for being here. Thanks all your organizations for co-sponsoring. Go Trees. <laughs>